In a previous video, I described microservice essentials, what are HTTP actions and response codes. In this video, I'm going to show how to implement some of those in Spring Boot. So first, let's look at an endpoint. We remember that an endpoint has a protocol, and then it has a domain, and then an endpoint name, and then optionally, it can have some unique identifying parameters. Now take a look at this method in my Spring Boot controller. Note the request mapping. The request mapping has the endpoint lookup, and then it has that unique identifier in curly braces. And also note it has the slash on the question mark key in a US keyboard before the, before the endpoint, after the endpoint, and then after the unique identifier. It does a bit of magic here. Let's go ahead and test this out. And I'm going to test this out with Postman, which allows me to make a request directly to an endpoint. I could also use a browser for some of these, but Postman lets us see a few more details. So we'll start with this URL, this endpoint. I'm going to hit send. And note that what comes back is it says your number 23. So let's see how we got that. You notice that we have a method here, and the method has an endpoint, which says that's the endpoint that I'm going to map to. So we saw just right there, relative to the domain and the port. And then after that, we have a variable or a parameter variable here in this method signature. But note that it's annotated with at path variable. An at path variable is how we're able to pull a value out of a URL. Now what we do is we take that, we associate it with this variable named ID, and then we include that in our output here. And therefore, that's the output that we see in Postman, your number 23, and down here we see your number and then that variable that represents the value passed in. And in our case, the value passed in was 23. Naturally, if I were to change that to 25, for instance, uh, we would get back your number 25. Now, notice something funny. If I take off that last slash, it's going to do something totally different. It gives me a not found because if we are including a unique identifier in this URL, we need to terminate it with a slash. So that's endpoint. Let's consider status codes now. One thing I'll note is that I've put all the logic in the controller to give us a simple explanation here, but typically a lot of these status codes we would get by calling a downstream class, like a service class or a DAO. And if everything goes well, it's going to tell us. But if it catches an exception, many times it will respond to us with an error, and that's where we're going to use these error status codes. We'll take a look at some of these things that I've set up. You'll see that we have an endpoint called invalid here. And that endpoint called invalid has something called a response entity object, which is the same thing that this returns. A response entity object can contain a body, which is essentially the data that we see. If you think of a traditional web page, this would just be the HTML that's served up to a browser. It has headers, which does things like describe what type of data we're getting back. In this case, it's text plain. Now, here's where things get nice, though, is it has an optional third parameter, which is that HTTP status code. And we know forbidden is one of those status codes that we talked about in our presentation. And OK is another status code. That's the one that equals 200, which means everything went OK. So let's try both the invalid endpoint, which has the forbidden HTTP status, and then we'll try the valid endpoint, which has the OK HTTP status. So we'll go back over here to Postman and slash invalid. And you'll note that we did get a response. When I go to the param screen, it returned to us a 403 forbidden. So we talked about the 200 status codes, 403 forbidden. There we go right there. And you see here the constant HTTP status forbidden, and that will give us 403 forbidden. Now we know that we also had a valid endpoint that will return 200. So let's go ahead and hit that endpoint. And you see 200 OK here. 200 OK standard response for successful HTTP requests. And we go back to IntelliJ and let's take a look. HTTP status OK, which sure enough corresponds to that 200 OK, and that's the status code we want to see many times. One more thing to point out on that valid JSON endpoint. Notice that I added headers and I said specifically it's going to be application JSON. And then I put some quick and dirty JSON down here just to prove out the concept. If we take a look at our response, look at our headers, and sure enough, you see content type application JSON. 
When you're responding with JSON data, it's a good idea to put that into the header so that you're telling whoever's hitting you the type of data that they will get back, and that might help them decide what to do with the data. Now, there's actually a quick and dirty way to create JSON directly from an object in Spring Boot, and take a look at this annotation response body. What that means is the return type can be any type of object that you want. And when it returns this object, it's going to automatically marshal it into JSON. So let's see what happens here when I hit JSON object endpoint. If you take a look here, you see a native tree with delicious fruit and several other parameters like a plant ID, a specimen ID, longitude, latitude, so on and so forth. But the important part is it's in a JSON format. And if we go back and take a look at what we created here, we simply created a general Java object and Spring Boot was smart enough to convert it to JSON for us. This is a simple case because we only have one object, but imagine instead if we have a whole set of data that we need to convert to JSON. This automatic conversion is really handy. Now with that covered, let's consider one more thing, which is our HTTP actions. So far, we've essentially been reading data, which is a git. And we know the action verb, git post put delete patch, will determine how the server should handle this request. If it's going to read something, if it's going to create new, update, replace, modify, or delete. Given that those verbs indicate different behavior, we should probably have a different method for each of the verbs that we want to support. We can do that easily with this request mapping annotation by simply adding method equals and then request method. And then from there, note that it has constants that represents each of the HTTP actions and especially the ones that we want, get, patch, post, delete, so on and so forth. So that's one way to do it, but there's actually a shortcut as well. Let's go to the bottom and notice I have an annotation here called post mapping. Post mapping is the same as request mapping, but it automatically builds in that method equals request mapping dot post. So it just saves a lot of typing there, but it's saying I'm only going to handle post requests. Now notice we have the value, which is the endpoint, in this case create specimen. Notice here we also have a consumes and produces type, which says that we will only accept uh, application JSON data and we will produce application JSON data. In this case, what we're doing is we're consuming JSON and we're turning it into an object. Now look at the body of this method. It's not really big, is it? I have one line in here so I can set a debug breakpoint, which I've already done. And then I have a return statement. And aside from that, I simply have a parameter variable with the at request body annotation. And that at request body annotation is important because it's saying, hey, look, I've received some JSON and I bet that I can use some naming conventions to turn this JSON from straight text into an object. Now, here's the cool part. You notice that we've already run this endpoint, which is going to create a specimen object and then give us the JSON equivalent. So we have the JSON right now. What we want to do is go in the opposite direction. We want to take JSON and post it up here to this controller and get a specimen object in return. So let's give that a try. We say create specimen. This is where Postman is really handy over a browser because this is where I can go in and I can, I can physically give it some JSON data. So we want to make sure we have post selected over here. I realize now I had post selected all along by mistake. Those previous calls should have been gets, but it actually doesn't make a difference because I didn't specify post or get on the endpoint. But nonetheless, if we specifically want to post, let's make sure we have post selected. Notice we have all the other options here and several more as well. Now here's the important part. Let's take that JSON we got from our previous call that was getting a specimen. Let's go over to body, and I already pasted it in here, but nonetheless, we take that JSON and we paste it in. So very careful here, post, and then this JSON data means we're taking the JSON data and we are posting it to our endpoint, and we want our endpoint to create an object out of that. More than likely, it's going to create a record out of that object in some persistence layer somewhere, but we're not worried about that right now. Let's go ahead and hit send, and it will hit the breakpoint that I specified earlier. Sure enough, IntelliJ lights up for me. Now, I put a breakpoint there because I just wanted to mouse over specimen and show you that, sure enough, it was able to take that JSON, 
and convert it into an object. And there we go. You see, it's not just a plain old string, it's specimen, and then we have the plant ID attribute, the specimen ID, latitude, longitude, and description, and they're all populated. And if you take a look at the spelling and the capitalization, you'll notice that it's identical to what we have in the JSON here. And that's how it's able to marry that up automatically. So I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.